What's up? Welcome to Forte Catholic Radio with your host, Taylor Schroll. We are recording live on spring break from the Red Sea Radio Studios in College Station, Texas. I want to thank you for joining us, whether you are listening live on Red Sea here locally, or if you're on redsea.org slash listen, listening online, or you're listening on the podcast, on, on the website, or on iTunes or SoundCloud. It is great to be here today. It feels super weird recording the show today. So most of the time, I mean, the show's the same time every week, right? Well, it's usually dark at 7 o'clock. It is super bright outside, and it feels like the daytime, and I don't know what to do with myself because there's lights in the studio, and I usually have it pretty dark in here. So um, I am actually joined today uh, by uh, Mr. Wesley Schimmick. He's here producing the show today. He had a pretty good joke to start the day off. Um, I am the Forte Catholic, the loud Catholic. He said... uh, He's the he's the quiet Catholic. So I told him to, to hold down the fort while I left, and he's going to do an entire segment of the the quiet Catholic show. Um, it's just going to be silence for an entire segment. Uh, I'm just kidding. We have a great show planned for you today. We are talking about vocations all day. Um, I got to go. Uh, listen to Father Jonathan Rea, who's the vocations director for our diocese here, the Diocese of Austin. Um, I got to hear him speak to a group of of high school students at. Uh, St. Mary's in Brenham about two weeks ago, and he brought one of the the greatest uh, vocation discernment packets I've ever seen in my entire life. We'll talk about that in the first segment. In the second segment, I am going to be joined by the married Catholic guy from marriedcatholicguy.com. He's going to be talking to us about um, the vocation of marriage and, and how God saved his marriage. And then in the final segment, we're going to continue our conversation on vocations and what that discernment and preparation talks about. Um, I have posted on Facebook and Twitter and um, our question of the day. Uh, so if you want to follow me on Facebook or on Twitter, it's at Taylor Schroll, S-C-H-R-O-L-L. I put out the question for today of what makes a great spouse and also what makes a good priest or religious. So if you want to uh, go ahead and answer that, you can, you can do that there, and I'll uh, talk about it on the show in the third segment. Also, if at any point you want to call in today, it's 855-683-7332. And I remembered the last number because I couldn't see it because Wesley's big head was in the way. Um, so if you want to call in and tell us about what, what makes a great spouse or what makes a great priest or nun, or also if you want to talk about like how you knew um, what your what God was calling you to for your vocation? Because we have a lot of people listening who are high school students, who are junior high students, who are college students, who are still trying to figure out what God is calling them to. So um, again, that number is eight five five six eight three seven three three two. So we're going to jump right into this, and I'm going to talk about um, this packet that Father Jonathan Rea, the vocations director, brought. The first page. So it's like this little fold out, you know. Not trifold, quadfold. Is that even a thing? So you know, the, the the first page just says YOLO, be holy. So it's like you only live once, right? The the whole this whole ordeal that everybody like yells before, like on spring break, right? YOLO, man, I'm gonna go take this shot and then jump off a cliff. It's like whoa, 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 calm down, man. You need to calm down. Um, it's YOLO is that thing that people scream. Like, whenever they want to do something that they know they shouldn't do. It's like, YOLO, man. You're never going to be in college ever again. Apparently, everyone in college sounds like somebody from the boondocks. That makes sense. Uh, (laughs) Hey, they need to go, too. All right. Um, So, this is a a packet from Viani Vocations. And what it's talking about is you only live once. You only get one shot. Do not miss your chance to blow because opportunity comes once in a lifetime. I, I just quoted Eminem on a Catholic radio show. Um, it's probably the first or maybe second time that's ever happened in life. Uh, so the whole goal of this life is to be holy as God is holy. So uh, like whenever people ask Jesus what it meant to be holy, it's like only the Father is holy. It's like, well, crap, what are we supposed to do, right? Well, then he says like we should be fo- holy as the Heavenly Father is holy, right? So what holiness means is trying to be like Jesus in all ways. We all know that we are imperfect. We all know that we need to grow. We all know that we need to be 
more holy, right? And that's what this entire season of Lent is all about, is this, this prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, so that we can grow in holiness, so that we can become more like Jesus, so that we can share Jesus with other people, so that we can go to heaven uh, ourselves and bring as many people with us as we can. So holiness is the first vocation. And if you think that this all sounds really smart, it's because I'm almost verbatim reading from this Vianney Vocations uh, pamphlet on my computer here. Wes, Wesley's like, no, you're not. It's on my computer. Don't worry. So let's talk about um, these four main vocations. And I know, like, I, I actually posted this picture two weeks ago. So if you want to see this picture that I'm about to describe to you, uh, you can go on my Instagram, go on my Facebook two weeks ago and see this picture. I, it got a lot of traction on Facebook because of people arguing. It was really funny to watch all these, like, Catholic people arguing about well, there's only three vocations. No, there's four. And I'm just like sitting here, like, you know, eating Cheetos and laughing and watching this thing. Cause I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't really care. Right. So, so here's the deal. In this packet says that there's four, uh, marriage, the priesthood, religious life, and single life. Right. Um, those are the stages of life that people find themselves in. Right. Uh, marriage is, is pretty obvious. And what it says here is that, uh, most people are called to marriage to wholeheartedly love their spouse and to joyfully welcome children. The purpose of marriage is for a man and woman to help each other get to heaven and to teach the children to do the same. Like any vocation, marriage must be discerned, not assumed, right? What we need to do is, is walk into this discernment, right? Because what it says is that most people are, are going to be called to marriage. Um, and most people are going to be married, right? The majority of people, the majority of people don't become religious life or don't join religious life, don't join the priesthood. The majority of people are, get married, but what they're saying is this needs to not be assumed, that we need to discern it just like any other vocation, right? The other big vocation is priesthood. It says that a priest's job is to bring Jesus to people and people to Jesus, primarily through preaching the gospel and administering the sacraments. Priests are ordained for this ministry by a bishop who himself was ordained by a bishop on and on and on for 2,000 years. So we call this unbroken t- tradition apostolic succession. So your local priest was ordained by your local bishop, right? That, lo- that bishop was ordained by another bishop, and it literally goes back every generation, all the way back to the original apostles, Jesus' original um, 12 followers, right? So he gave, he made them the first priests, and it literally goes for 2,000 years, right? And so the, the priesthood, their main job is to, is, is to bring Jesus to people and people to Jesus, primarily through preaching the gospel, which we see them do every Sunday. Actually, you know, if you go to daily mass, you see them do it every day, right? If you go, if you go to daily mass, they do the short homilies. I love those. They are absolutely fantastic. And then they obviously um, administer the sacraments, right? Like that's their main job. And it's so funny because we talk a lot about the priesthood, how um, in working in a parish that, you know, at most parishes, they're also the business director and they're the manager and they're all these other things. It's like a lot of that stuff just kind of comes with the territory, but the main thing that they're supposed to do is to administer the sacraments and preach the gospel, right? All right, so religious life. Both men and women can join religious orders, such as the Franciscans. Whoop, I went to Franciscan University. I like them the best. Should I still list these other ones? I guess I'll list the other ones. Uh, Dominicans, Benedictines, all these other things, right? Um, The life and the work of religious orders varies greatly from communities that dedicate themselves to lives of prayer to those who work actively in schools, hospitals, hospitals, orphanages. Um, so like a lot of times we, we hear nun or sister. I used to think that these terms were kind of interchangeable, right? That a nun was a sister and a sister was a nun. Well, what, there are these different, um, types of religious orders. Some of them are, um, primarily devoted to prayer, right? So those are the nuns. They live in a convent and their primary thing is to pray for the rest of the church. But then there are sisters who are, um, I went to the University of the Carter Word, and, and there was an order of sisters that ran the school, but, and they were, they were nurses, they were teachers, they were out in the community, and obviously they still prayed, right, just like anybody else would, but they lived kind of amongst the people. Um, it says that the glue that holds together religious life are the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, right? So all, all these people who take these religious vows – they, they vow to poverty. So it, it means living a non-lavish life. It means living um, very, very simply monetarily. Um, a vow of chastity, right? Like they, they forego 
sex for their entire life so that they can, because what they are doing is they are marrying Jesus. So they're for, marriage is a great thing. Sex is a great thing, but they are foregoing it on this earth. So because they're looking forward to the perfect union with Jesus in heaven. And then obedience. They are they are obedient to the church. They're obedient to their superiors, right? So that is the rule that they live by. And then finally, the last one, the, the controversial one uh, that, that got people all riled up on my Facebook what is single life. It says that, that um, and before I even talk about single life, like before you get married, become a priest or join religious life, like those are your main three options. Like everybody is in single life, right? So uh, if you're listening to this right now and you are not married, not a priest in religious life, this is you, homie. This is, who, this is exactly where you are right now. And, and I, like, even though I am married now, I got married almost five years ago. F- like, my, my anniversary is, is this June. The day, be- the day before that, I was single. The day before my wedding, I was single, right? So all of us at some point in our life are single. It says that some people are called to serve God as single people without marrying or taking special vows, but nonetheless serving the church in a meaningful way. Single people, this is a quote from the catechism, contribute greatly to the good of the human family. Um, And then another quote from the catechism, some live their situation in the spirit of the Beatitudes, serving God and neighbor in exemplary fashion, right? So a lot of these people, I, I know some people who are like single for life, right? They, they've they devoted themselves not to be married, not to join the priesthood, not to be, be religious. And, and they are, they, so they work and then they have all this time to serve, right? Because they don't have to go home to, to a wife or a husband and, or they don't have to, um, you know, hear people's confessions, <laughs> all those kinds of things. They don't have kids running around, all these types of things, right? So they are completely devoted to service of the church. And they're some of the greatest people in my life, right? Um, so this, this packet also says that aside from your decision to follow Jesus, your vocation is life's most important decision, right? So whether you choose marriage, priesthood, religious life, or single life, or whether you've already chose one of those things, that's the second most important decision you'll ever make in your entire life. So it's definitely an important thing, right? So there is a lot of things that, that people kind of push back on on some of these other vocations, right? Because most people get married. It's like, and I, 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 I'm going to tell my story in the third segment of like how, um, what my discernment looked like for my vocation and, and, um, a lot of the excuses that I said. So this next page on this thing was, is just absolutely fan, fantastic. And it, and it goes through a lot of the common, uh, excuses that people give to not be a priest or not be religious. Right. So the question says me, a nun, a priest, I'm not sure about that. Um, so the biggest, the first thing that it says is, uh, the first question that it ad- is addresses, how can I know that I'm being called? I would want to be certain. And the answer says that it takes time, it takes prayer, it takes careful discernment to know you're being called to priesthood and religious life. And eventually you have to enter a seminary or convent to be sure. This is like for people who are discerning priesthood or religious, religious life. Very, very, very few people are mistakenly ordained or inadvertently make religious vows. Like, so there's a lot of people who are feared or who are afraid that they're just going, that they're going to become a priest or they're going to become a nun. And then all of a sudden, 10 years later, they'd be like, well, dang it, that's not what God called me to. Right. And like all throughout this discernment process, forma- their formation takes years and years and years. Um, and during this time of formation, like, let's say you're somebody who's going to discern where you, you want to go and study to become a priest. Right. You are in a process of discernment for about seven, maybe even nine years, depending on what kind of priest you want to be. All in that time, you can back out literally until the moment that you get ordained, right? All through that time, you're discerning, and all through that time, the people at the seminary are judging you, right? (laughs) They are discerning just as well on whether you are a good fit for the priesthood, right? And I made that sound kind of scary. It's really not. Is there Everybody in this entire um, scenario is in a process of discernment, right? Um, and like I said, you can you can you can leave the seminary convent at any time. So I I know a lot of people who have done this. Um, a lot of great people who are or uh, either single now or they're married now have have a ton of kids now who were studying to become a priest or studying to become a sister, and then all of a sudden they they discern or maybe not all of a sudden either all of a sudden or over a long course of time they discern that that the priesthood or, or becoming a, a religious is not what God is calling them to. And now they've found their vocation, right? And a lot of these people, it's really interesting because um, some people are like, oh, you wasted your time studying for the priesthood and now you're not going to be a priest, right? 
like, just think about taking a year out of your life or two years out of your life, whatever it ends up being, right? A lot of the people that, that I know that are turned out was about a year or two. Like, you're telling me that a, a, a year or two where you studied faith, you studied religion, you studied philosophy, you prayed uh, multiple hours a day, you had a community of people that all supported you, and you had, a, like, you're telling me that that's a bad year or two? Like, that's absolutely great, right? There was a vocations director in another diocese that I used to work in. He would say, I wish every guy would go through this um, for one year, right? Either right before college or right after college. To take a year, and if you think about it, a year out of your life, what's the average lifespan? Like 70, 75, something like that? Mine's probably going to be like 40-something. But, you know, the average is about 70, 75. And so what, what in the grand scheme of things, what is one year in your 20s? 18, 19, 20, right? To literally decide what your life's going to look like for the next 50 years. <laughs> What's one year or just the time of discernment, right? Um, and you can do that in a seminary. You can do that in a convent. Or you can do like me and take, like have this, this intentional year of discernment while I was also going to school and, and I started dating towards the end of that time and all these kinds of things, right? I'll get more into that in, in, our, in our final segment about that actual discernment process. But um. The one thing that it says about when, when you're getting closer to a final decision, so when you're six, seven years um, into your discernment of, of religious life, um, God will give you a true inner peace about your true vocation. Like, like not many people, like I never heard a voice whenever um, I, 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 I'm married. I have, a, I have a wife and two kids. I never heard a voice, Taylor, you should get married in June of 2012. I was like, eh, really? June? It's really hot and I sweat a lot. You sure you want to be doing? Yes, June. Like that never happened, right? Like I've never heard a voice of God um, <laughs> in, in my prayer, right? But I definitely had this huge sense of inner peace in my discernment whenever I was deciding whether or not I should marry my beautiful bride. Um, so we're going to pause this, pause the conversation for now. Um, and Whenever we come back from the break, we're going to be talking to the married Catholic guy, um, talking about his vocation to marriage, how he helps people in their marriages, and then also like some of the struggles within his vocation and how God helped to save his broken marriage. So we will be right back here in just a few seconds. Stay with us. As promised, we are here with the married Catholic guy, Mr. Dean Willett. Dean, how you doing over there today? I'm doing great, Taylor. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. We've been having some fun on Twitter, uh, going back and forth about some things, and it's it's great to to finally have you on the show. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to my guests? Well, I uh, live out in Phoenix, Arizona. I My uh, wife and I have been married since 1991. Currently, we have seven kids. Our eighth is on the way. Wow. And Congratulations. As I, as, I, as I say that, I realize I haven't told my parents yet, so I guess I better <laughs> tell them before this <laughs> podcast goes up. We, we can edit that out of the podcast, I guess. <laughs> we can leave it out there. It'll force me to finally tell them. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it, it, it's, I felt like it's been my mission to kind of help troubled marriages over the last few years. And the reason I am doing that is because my wife and I had filed for divorce twice and uh, we are happier than ever and better than ever right now because we learned how to deal with those situations. Man, that's absolutely fantastic to hear. I'm great. Great to hear that. I've been reading up on you on your blog um, over at marriedcatholicguy.com um, and, and kind of getting some background story on that. Before we get into any of that, I'm just blown away that you've been married since 1991. I was born in 1989. So like you've been oh, doing great, you've been doing this married thing since I was literally a diapers, man. Um so you're obviously better at me better better than me at marriage. I've been married for 5 years. Our producer here Wesley has been married for one now. Is it one? Yeah, a year and a month or two so far. A, a year in yeah. a month? A year and 
two months actually. Oh, a year and two months. Yeah. All right. So yeah, let's let's talk about that, man. Because like filing for divorce twice is actually a pretty serious thing, right? So like, how did you go from b- almost getting divorced twice to having this great marriage, and now you go around helping other people's marriages? What happened? Well. I grew up in a family where, I mean, we were Catholic by name, but we didn't really practice, never went to church for uh, most of my life. Um, but we called ourselves Catholics, at least I did. And, you know, I had always grown up under the impression that I will never get divorced. It's just not an option. So when we got married, you know, we went through our romance stage of our marriage where things were just absolutely perfect. And in 2003, things got a little tough on we start because of my work responsibilities at the time I was working basically two full-time jobs in one position um 80 to 100 hours a week and I was never home wow. and things things were just bad so we moved to Pennsylvania so I could get a new start and well things didn't change really um I was working more and gone from the house more and then one day my wife and I were having a fight and she said maybe we should just get divorced and I went from thinking I'm never going to get divorced, it's not even an option, to all of a sudden divorce is not only an option, but it's likely. Um, so I filed for a divorce in Pennsylvania. The long story, um, we decided to try to make it work again, but there was a lot of toxic stuff with our relationships in Pennsylvania. So we decided we're going to do it one more time and we moved to Arizona. And I got here and we had a few up and down years, but things were not really getting better. And the thing that really kept us together is at the time we had four kids and I didn't want somebody else raising my kids. And my wife, whose parents were divorced, didn't want to bring divorce into our kids' lives too. So our kids kind of kept us together. We never stayed together for us. It was always for the kids. Um, And then... Finally, in 2009, um, things started changing in my life spiritually. I actually found God again, which is a whole nother story. But, you know, I was finally brought back into the church and the true Catholic and became deep in my faith because of some things that happened in 2009. And we went through Retrovi and Retrovi literally helped save our marriage. Yeah, let's talk about that. So what is Retrovi? I've I've heard about it. Um, not really, not really sure what it was until you until you uh, shared your blog with me, and I read a little bit more about it. So why don't you share a little bit? Because I mean, like you have this amazing story of you y'all's marriage was going absolutely one way, and then it just uh, seemed to kind of take this three sixty or you know, uh, not three sixty. That would be right back where you started. This one eighty, right? <laughs> um, what is Retrovi, and how did it help you? Well, I, I would start by saying that Retrovi turned our marriage one eighty, but it didn't do it overnight. It took months and months of going back and forth before we finally were able to really turn that corner. But Retrovi is a program we learned about through the therapist my wife was seeing at our church. She recommended to us. It was um, we have a group in Phoenix that is you know it's part of the Catholic Church's you know mission to help save marriages. And what it does is it takes trouble marriages. And we're talking about when, when we're talking to people retro, right, we say, you know, if we're talking to a therapist or something, we say those marriages that you can't save, give them to us. Kind of like a last hope resort sort of thing to try to save a marriage. So we went through a weekend where over the weekend, we did a lot of talking. We learned how to communicate. You know, I had been married for a long time at that point, And I thought I knew how to communicate with my wife. I thought I knew how to talk to her. And um, I realized that I didn't. I never knew how to communicate with my wife. And part of communicating is listening. And I'm one of those, you know, stubborn Frenchmen who, when I have something in my mind, that's all I'm thinking about. And if somebody's talking to me, I'm thinking about my next counter argument, not about what they're really saying. And Retrovi gave us the tools to really help us deal with those sort of situations and work through our troubles. Yeah, that, that's dude. I can totally relate with you on that. I am not a Southern Frenchman. Um, I guess like pretty close though. I'm Cajun, so I mean that's kind of like what a Southern Frenchman is, right? Um, <laughs> stubborn, stubborn. Yeah, Frenchman. Stub- uh, hey, 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 don't call me out of the air, okay? I, I, I yeah. we, we can hang up at any time. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, I can totally relate with that. Like, I, I love winning. Like, I took this, this, uh, 
it's a personality test, and my number one thing is achiever, and my number five is competition. So I'm every time I'm in a conversation, whether it's with any random person or even with my wife, like I just want to win the conversation. I'm like, well, that's dumb. <laughs> like that's not what I should be doing, right? Um, so it's, you said that it, it, it improved your communication, and I know uh, uh, you don't want to give away too much about uh, what Retrofy does in the weekend. Otherwise, people wouldn't go because they just do it at the, ha- at the house, right? But like, in what ways did y'all's communication um, improve? Um, over those next few months after you went to this retreat? Well, it it got us talking about things that had been a poison in our marriage for a long time. You know, we kind of, the way I have always dealt with trouble in the past is just kind of ignore it and move on. So, you know, we had a lot of situations where years and years of trouble and and lack of communication had led to just this atmosphere of us not trusting each other, us not wanting to be around each other or talk to each other sort of thing. So it learned, we, what we learned is to break down that wall. And, you know, we learned that, you know, together we can be strong, she can be strong and I can be strong. But once we build that bridge of communication to each other, it, it, I, the way I like to think of it is two walls. You know, she can be one strong wall, but a wall standing up by itself with no support will only stand for so long. I was kind of like that other, another wall straight across from her. Communication was the bridge that joined those two walls together to really make it solidify. So, you know, we learned how to, if, if, if there's an issue, how not to blame each other. We learned how not to always project our feelings onto somebody. You know, one thing we do a lot when we communicate with each other is we assume we know what they're thinking. And until we can really hear from their lips what is going on, you know, we don't quite understand what, what they really are thinking because we're not inside their head. You can take something as little as, you know, an argument over the way somebody drives. You know, I assume, let's say I'm driving and my wife's upset. She, she can assume I'm driving one way for one reason. I think she's thinking I'm doing something else. And until we can find a way to talk to each other and understand what each other is saying and thinking you know we really can't move past those assumptions (laughs) you're you're (laughs) you're making me laugh because me and my wife talk all the time and we're like i'm like honey i can't read your mind and she's like well dang it (laughs) i I really need i really need to grow in that uh in that gift i need to pray to god ask to give me that gift of being able to read uh, my wife's mind but no I, i totally get what you're saying um you've been talking about a lot of these like toxic things that come up in, in marriage, so, uh, one of them we, you just mentioned was about like ignoring troubles and like how uh, you're trying to push them under the rug. Um, and I know a lot of people in marriages do that. You talked about um, work responsibilities and how that was how that was a struggle. Um, if other people are struggling with these things in their marriages, whether it be work responsibilities or ignore, just ignoring their troubles or not knowing how to communicate or any of these other toxic things, like because I know that you go around and you want to equip men. Um, to be able to deal with these things. So what would you say um, to the to the guys listening to my audience today about how to deal with these toxic things, um, both in your relationship and um, by yourself? Uh, the first thing I would say is shut up and listen. Um, I will. We talk a little, <laughs> we, we, we talk a little too much at times instead of listening to what our spouse is really saying. And the words that they're saying, you know, feelings, you know, this is one of those guy things, you know, guy things, we don't talk about feelings, at least I never did. Um, feelings was kind of one of those things that other people dealt with. And I had to learn to understand that my wife has feelings about certain things, and they're never wrong or right. I'm sorry, they're never wrong. They're always right. Just because she feels a certain way, and I think she should feel a different way, doesn't mean that she's wrong. She is right, and I'm the one that's wrong for trying to uh, change her how she's feeling. If if she deals with something in a certain situ- certain way, I can't change her. I have to learn that this is how she deals with something, and vice versa. She has to learn how I deal with things, so she has to learn to understand and accept me. You know, marriages go through these four stages. The first stage is that romance stage. You know, everything is just absolutely perfect. You're newlyweds. Things couldn't get better. And then eventually a marriage gets uh, disillusionment stage. And disillusionment is when all of a sudden that thing that she's always done, all of a sudden starts bothering you, but it never quite bothered you before. Then eventually we get to a misery stage where we're just not happy because of the things 
that we haven't quite been dealing with in our marriage in a way that we should. And that's where most marriages get to. And that's where most marriages break down is in that misery stage. Because what we're taught by society these days, unfortunately, is that if you're not happy, you leave your spouse and find a new one, right? It's kind of like if you're not happy with your phone, you throw it away and you get a new one. And that's kind of how we're treating marriage these days. And it's up to us guys, I think, to really understand that this is not what we were called to do. This is not how we were called to live. And then the fourth stage is that awakening stage where you learn how to get past these things and deal with these issues. And I think, and in your awakening stage, as I, as I read on your blog, you can go check it out, marriedcatholicguide.com. Um, I was reading that like the biggest thing that changed y'all's marriage was doing this retrofi uh, retreat together, but also like you, you share your personal conversion or reversion story and how like that was one of the big moments in y'all's relationship as a couple. So what role does like personal faith of a man play in a marriage? I I think it is everything. Um, We're here for a reason. God has given us this life for a reason. And we need to understand that, you know, our role as a husband and a father is to help shepherd our family through this world that we live in today. And it's not always easy to do. And, when I, I mean, when we were having our problems, I, there were times in my life where I'd become a Catholic and not be a Catholic, become a Catholic and be like a Christer, Christmas Easter Catholic sort of thing. My wife converted in 96 after we'd been married for a while. And this is during one of my phases when I was a strong Catholic. And luckily she developed a stronger faith than I ever had. And she kept strong in that faith. So there were times in my life where I had, I, there was a time in my life when we were in our misery stage, when we were ready for divorce and filing for divorce, where I actually didn't believe in God. The first time in my life, I remember I was in my late thirties and I said, I don't even believe in God. I don't think he's really real. And I had never had that feeling before. And I had to let God back into my life because we need, we need, we need God at the center of our marriage. You know, it's a husband and a wife with God at the center that really keeps us strong and helps us protect our families when, you know, we run into problems. No, that's absolutely fantastic. I was, I was uh, reading that a lot of your conversion came through, you put God to the test and you went to mass every day and you uh, <laughs> kept hearing about St. Faustina. And my favorite line from your blog is your, your real, your, your reading the diary of St. Faustina and you quoted the more I read, the more I read, the more I realized I was a complete idiot. <laughs> like, if that's not growing in your faith, I don't know what is, right? Like, the more I grow in my faith, I, I, uh, I like, I think I'm pretty awesome. And then the more I grow in my faith, I'm like, wow, I, I kind of suck. Like, <laughs> I, need, I really need to get better at these kind of things, right? So there's that humility that comes with it, which is a great trait in a husband and father. So, um, yeah, hopefully I can learn from, continue to learn from you and your many years of marriage, um, as I'm still kind of a baby in this, in this, uh, realm of life. So, um, we have just a, a, cu- a couple of minutes here, here left. Um, and I want to like uh, just talk about retrovi one, one last time, um, because that's the, I think it's one of the main things that you wanted to come on and talk about. I have, um, I have here for people that want to, um, check it out here locally in our Austin diocese. There are some coming up. It's a just retrovi.org. Um, there are some coming up in the Austin area um, on March 24th, um, that weekend, and then also in October, if you want to check it out. So um, just kind of as a last-ditch effort, uh, Dean, what, why should people go to this, um, um, to this retreat weekend um, in order to save their marriage? Okay, so I, I, I want to come at it at two points. First of all, if your marriage is on the verge of breaking up, what else do you have to lose, Right. You, you want to do this for your family. I recently read a stat because something is going on um, in life that you, a teenage boy is 300 times more likely to try to commit suicide if his parents are divorced than if they're still married in the original marriage. Wow. 300 times. That's so crazy. There's a lot of destruction going on because of our breakdown in our marriage. So I, I, even if it's not you, but maybe it's somebody you know, some, your brother, your cousin, a friend at work, who you just know that they're not happy in their marriage and they're thinking about divorce, what do they have to lose? It, you know, it's worth trying to save. You know, God gave us this gift that's worth trying to save. So I think that, um, first of all, if, if they're going to help our marriage, 
search for help our marriage, which is easier to spell than retrovi help our marriage.com. <laughs> that will get them to the same site too. <laughs> um, it, it's a last chance effort to save your marriage, which is, you know, a gift from God that we shouldn't be throwing away. You know, God, God said, you know, one man, one wife, and let no man come between them. Well, when we're the ones that come in between that, between that, we're that one man coming between that marriage, and that's not the role that we were called to live. Well, I, not, I never thought of it that way, about me being the person in the middle of that. So, well, hey, thanks, Dean. Uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, to check Dean, Dean out, you can find him on Twitter. Speaking of things that are hard to spell, it's at D-E-A-N-O-U-E-L. L-E-T-T-E. He's a great follow on Twitter. Dean, thanks for coming on. I really do appreciate it. All right. Thanks for all you do. All right, brother. Have a good one. Have a good one. All right. We are back with our final segment of Forte Catholic for the evening. I want to thank Dean Willette for coming on to talk to us about Retrovine, about how God saved his marriage. Uh, he's a great dude. Go follow him on Twitter. He's a lot of fun. Um, he's also, a, 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 we bonded over not only this whole Catholicism and speaking thing um, and the radio, but we also bonded over the fact that we are both track coaches. So that's a lot of fun. Uh, so yeah, go check him out. Um, we're going to dr- hop right back into this um, vocations and discernment and preparation uh, topic, right? Because we we're, where we kind of left off, but... <clears throat> Um, I want to start by uh, sharing a little bit about the discernment of, of my vocation, right? Because a lot of people are like, oh, how do I discern? And I just have this like thing I have to get off my chest because it's one of my pet peeves about discernment. So a lot of people are like, oh, like I, they want that God to come and talk to them, right? Like I talked about in the first segment, um, but like that doesn't happen, right? So here's what I knew as a, I think I was 19 years old. I knew that the main thing God wanted for me was for me to trust him and for me to know that he had a plan for my life and for me to like trust him and not just go after what I wanted, right? Because I wanted to get married because I wanted to do the things that married people do, right? Like if we're being honest, like that's, I wanted to be married. And all through my life, people are like, oh, you'd be a great priest. I'm like, shut up, leave me alone. I don't want to be a priest, right? And that was pr- pretty, pretty darn close to exactly how I felt until I was about 19 years old. And I was growing in my faith and I just kept hearing this, like this, this tug on my heart of like God saying over and over again, either like God speaking either through my heart or just a thought that I continually had, or literally people in stadiums at conferences or people in my life saying like, Hey, like you're supposed to be open to whatever God wants for your life. Like you need to be open up to the priesthood. And I was like, well, fine, I guess. Right. So for one year, almost exactly to the day. For one year, I was like, okay, okay, God, like, I don't want to get married, but I want to be open to it. Or like, sorry, not, I don't want to be a priest, but I want to be open to it, right? Um, I messed that up. Um, I want to be open to this whole priesthood thing. I'm coming into this begrudgingly, but you know my heart. You know where I am, so help a brother out, right? So I started by just doing some prayer daily, right? Reading the scriptures, praying, like asking for God to lead me in the right direction. And then I started meeting with these priests who were kind of like recruiters, right? So if you think of like the army has recruiters, this was like this priest job for their religious orders, for the diocese to go and to, to meet with people to, to help bring them into the priesthood. The ones I met with, they, they weren't great. Like, like I'd go and I'd, I'd eat with them and it, it was like, it was super pushy and it was like just a sales pitch. And I was like, this is not fit with me well, right? So actually I, I had asked God, like, or I finally told God, like, like I've, I want to be open to priests, like you need to help me out. And then I get these th- like three or four priests in the first three months that completely turned me off even more to the idea. I'm like, God, like... I'm trying here. You got to help me out. Right. And then I found these, these priests, uh, the brothers, of the beloved disciple in San Antonio, my favorite priest in the entire world. Sorry to the other priests listening. Um, absolutely great people. They're faith filled people. And they, they like legitimately wanted me to find my vocation. Like they weren't like pushing me solely on the priesthood. They wanted to help me discern and find out what God wanted for my life. Right. So for nine months, I went and met with them for, um, once a month, 
I went and um, had dinner with them. I prayed the, the divine office with them. I did um, praise and worship with them. And I just, just got to sit there and talk with them to actually like talk about just regular life stuff. And then also this dull discernment process. And so I did that for about nine months and like continued the praying, continued going to adoration, continued um, asking God for help and, and trying to find answers from the scriptures or from other great people in my life for these priests. And then finally, about a year later, almost to the exact day of the day that I decided to do to do this, right? Um, I was in the Adoration Chapel at like three in the morning at Holy Spirit Catholic Church in San Antonio, Texas. Um, shout out to Holy Spirit for no apparent reason. Um, sitting in Adoration super early in the morning or late in, late in the night, really, if we're being honest. I was just up really late. Um, and I finally just like got on my knees. I was like, God, like I give up. I'm tried, tired of like fighting you because you win literally every time, right? Like I'm tired of fighting against you on this whole discernment thing. So if you want me to be a priest, I'll be a priest. I'm open to literally every vocation. A week later, I met this girl named Samantha Martinez in my religion class, who we had been in class with, with each other for about three months and never really talked before. I met her about a week later and now she's Samantha Schroll and she's the mother of my two children. Like this absolutely ridiculous, right? And not every, not everybody. So I tell this story and people are like, oh, so if I tell God I'll do whatever I want, I'll meet a, a girl in a week. I'm like, no, like that's, I can't tell you that because like, then you'll get mad at me if a week and you haven't met a girl. Right. Or you'll be like, oh, I met this girl seven days after you told me that I, I, I need to marry her. It's like, no, like she's 45 years old. You don't need to do that. Right. But the reason I tell this story is because it, I, it's not for the timeline. It's not for do this for a year and then seven days later you'll meet your spouse, right? But the whole point is like all God wants for us is to be open to whatever vocation that he has in store for us, right? Because he made us. He knows what's best for us. He knows where we're going to find the ultimate joy and ultimate fulfillment, and that's what he wants us to do, right? So how the heck do we prepare for that, right? That's one of the bi other big questions I get. Like, oh, how do I prepare for something where I don't know what I'm going to be doing, right? How do I pre prepare for a vocation of being a husband and a father or being a priest? Like, if I'm going to prepare to be an, an engineer or prepare to be a radio show host, like, I'll probably do different preparation, right? But if we if we take a closer look at this, and I actually um, sent, out a, sent out a tweet and a f Facebook post. Those are so... A, a Facebook... <laughs> <laughs> Facebook is so boring now. There's not a cool word for it. But I, I ask people, um, what is the best quality in a spouse or what's the best quality in a priest or a nun? And the answers I got were interesting. Um, the first one I got, um, because she stalks me, is this lady named Marie Martin, who may or may not be my mother. Um, <laughs> she said, uh, the biggest thing is, is patience and perseverance. So those are the tr two traits that she says are most important in a spouse. She says, uh, it's weird because her name is Marie Martin on Facebook. because She doesn't want people to know who we are, but then she posts on my Facebook saying your dad pulled us through 30 years of marriage with those qualities. So she kind of gave herself away. Um, and then she says, hashtag, I'm a handful mom. I'm proud of you for using a hashtag. Um, I, I, I and that's going to be trending later this evening because of the show and people are going to share it. Amen. The end. Just kidding. It's not the end. So uh, the next the next person said, um, this was Diane Gott Thompson. She's the uh, mother of one of the youth in my old youth program. She said, genuine commitment to vows no matter what. Like, stand and firm in what you said, right? Whether whether you, you take vows to become a priest, or you take vows to become uh, a husband or wife, whatever you do, like actually being fully committed to those no matter what happens. Um, Victor Hernandez, good friend of mine, says, um, I went to confession, and here he and hearing the priest tell me that I am loved by God was a helpful reminder and advice. So like being reminded that we are a chosen child of God helps in this entire discernment process about what, what, it, what we are called to be. Um, guy named Monty Chris, who again, uh, he, I've, I've mentioned his comments on, uh, on the show before, not sure why he's hiding his identity because he's a good person, but whatever. Monty Chris said, uh, knowing how to forgive and accept forgiveness. So like, Obviously, if you're going to be a priest, uh, you need to know how to forgive people because that's one of the biggest things you're going to be doing is in the sacrament of reconciliation, like being in persona Christi and absolving people of their sins, right? But also being able to accept forgiveness, right? Being able to give and accept this mercy. Um, one of my favorite topics to talk about, but I'll go on a tangent if I start talking about it now. Um, 
But I love that quality. And then uh, f- the, finally, this last one here is from uh, a girl I mentioned a little earlier. Her name's Samantha Schroll. Um, that is my wife. The quality that she says is courageous and knows the meaning of unconditional love. So I don't know if this is a compliment to me or if she's like subtweeting me and this is what she wants me to do from now on. But either way, being courageous and knowing the meaning of uncondi- unconditional love are great things to have. And she's obviously talking about in a husband, right? Uh, actually, we've got we've got a couple of more here rolling in um, in the last couple of minutes. Um, this guy named Joe Foster um, said pure honesty, either as a priest or as, as a, uh, um, a husband or a father or a wife or a mother, all these kinds of things, right? Um, which I get, I get what he's saying, but when I hear that, I'm like, you know, there's that whole question, does this dress make me look fat? I'm like, well, in that case, you might w- not want to use some pure honesty. But again, thanks, Joe, for, for your comment, because I know what you actually mean. Um, my buddy Chris Massengay says obedience, which is funny, because I know that he was discerning uh, religious life for a long time, maybe still is, um, or discerning the priesthood. So he's probably thinking along the priesthood vein. But uh, me being obedient to my wife is a very good, uh, <laughs> very good advice as well. Wesley's laughing because he's been married for a, a year and a couple months now. And if he hasn't learned now, he will soon. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and then one of my best friends from growing up, uh, Mr. Drew Sellers, uh, says loyalty and transparency. I've never met a transparent person. I can see all of them. So I don't know how I'm supposed to do that. Um, uh, Wesley's about to mute me. He's, he's tired of listening to me talk. Um, <laughs> So thank you guys for for uh, for sharing that. And the reason I want to bring that question up today is because, oh, how do I prepare to be a good husband or father? How do I prepare to be a good wife or mother or a nun or a priest or all these things, right? And I think it goes all the way back to that the, the thing that we started the show off with, with this, this pamphlet from Beyond Vocations. YOLO. You only live once, so be holy, right? Because here's the deal. All these qualities, being patient and, and perseverance, uh, commitment to your vows, um, knowing that you're loved, knowing how to forgive, accept forgiveness, um, being courageous, knowing unconditional love, being honest, obedience, loyalty, transparency. Those are all qualities of good priests and good husbands, good nuns and good wives, right? So if you want to prepare for the vocation that God has in store for you, grow in holiness. That's it, right? So, like, there's, it's not like priests have to be super, like, intellectual and dads have to be stupid. Like, there's not, there's not a path on that, right? Although, technically, that's probably the case, right? There's a lot of uh, priests that are a lot smarter than I am a uh, uh, good dad, but whatever. Um, we all need to grow in all of these things, whether we're married, whether we're a priest, whether we're a nun, whether we are whatever. These are all things that will help us out in our discernment process and things that will help us to get there, right? So we're going to jump back into some of these some of these things, kind of finish off the show, some of these other uh, things that people push back with, right? Um, one of the, um, and how we're going to do this is there's a, on this pamphlet, it says um, certain things, like certain excuses from guys specifically, and then certain excuses from girls. Um, so we'll start with the guy one. It says, uh, priesthood seems boring, right? <laughs> Uh, the, the, the response from these priests, are you talking about the same priesthood that we are? Priests have one of the best, most exciting jobs in the world. They stand with people in the most profound moments in their life, weddings, baptisms, deathbeds, and everything in between, right? So it, the joke is that priests can go through an entire lifetime in one day, right? They can be at a baptism in the morning, at a wedding in the afternoon, uh, um, and then at a funeral uh, later on in the evening, right? Like you can live an entire life in one day. That sounds fun. A good priest is warm, friendly, and radiates the love of Jesus. If you're called to be a priest, trust that you will be happy, right? Like, no matter what your vocation is, if you listen to God and you go through this discernment process, like, God wants your ultimate happiness. He wants your ultimate fulfillment, and your vocation is going to be the second biggest way that that's going to happen, right? Choosing to live for him is number one, and choosing your vocation and, like, listening to God and what he wants for you and your vocation is going to bring you so much holiness. And then here's my favorite response to this, right? Because one of the things that people say is, uh, guys say especially, I'm not holy enough. And then this 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 uh, Fiani Vocations responds, no, you're not. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's not the answer I was expecting. No, you're not holy, holy enough. Get over it. No priest who ever lived was worthy. But through God's grace, those who are called share in the priesthood of Jesus Christ. Of course you're not ready to be a priest now. That is not That is what the years of seminary training are for. Give your weaknesses to God and trust that over time, you will grow in virtue, right? So like that is great uh, <laughs> encouragement uh, 
to me thinking in times where I like, oh, I'm not holy enough to be a good husband or father. And I like for people who are studying to become a priest, oh, I can't be a priest. That's too holy. It's like maybe you're not ready now, but you can be ready in the next five to seven years of your uh, preparation, right? All right, so what do girls say? Girls say, I'm too romantic to be a nun. It's like, okay, here's the deal. Um, I want a guy to sleep me off my feet. I want walks on the beach, candlelight dinners, intimate conversations, and warm embraces. And the funny thing about that, there are thousands of religious scissors who are head and over heels in love with Jesus Christ, who relish being his bride, who will do anything to please him, and who are too romantic to choose any other kind of life, right? Like like some of these nuns, man, I meet these nuns and they like, they love Jesus so much, it's absolutely ridiculous, right? Like he's their husband. It's crazy to, to see. Um, one of the other ones for, for girls, it's a big deal. I want a husband and kids so bad. I don't know why every girl sounds like that, but they do. Since I was a little girl, I've dreamed of a beautiful wedding, a loving husband, and having cute kids of my own. Well, that's how you should feel. It's totally natural to desire a family, whether you're a woman or a man. And that's why many young women struggle to discover um, if they are called to be uh, to marriage and motherhood or to celibate consecrated life. Ultimately, those who make vows of celibacy feel a supernatural call, something that is more profound than their desire for a natural family, right? So naturally, this is a a big one for for guys and girls. Naturally, like we all desire to be married and to have kids. Like that's part of who we are. It's part of how we're made, literally, right? So um, it's a supernatural thing to be celibate. And it's something that is a totally a call, but it's that, it's that whole thing that like where God calls you, he will equip you, right? You, you get special graces from every sacrament so that if, if you are called to be celibate as a priest, you're called to be celibate as a nun, um, this, that God will help you with all of that. So, um, wherever you are in your discernment process, whether you've been married for a ton of years, like Dean Willette was, or if you're newly married like me, or if you're discerning, or if you're a, a young person who is like, I'm not even, I'm in high school. I'm not thinking about what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Right. Um, I hope that this, that this show had something for you, right. Um, something to revitalize your marriage or revitalize your vocation or, or, or um, real tools to equip you with how to prepare um, for whatever vocation God is calling you to. And um, one resource that I want to share with you that's going to be put up on uh, Forte Catholic this evening is uh, Sister Christina Newman uh, from St. Anne's Guest Home. Um, she writes at our Franciscan Fiat blog. Um, uh, one of uh, she's writing a guest post for Forte Catholic. It'll go up about why she's so excited about being a religious sister. So um, I want to thank you guys for joining me today. Uh, check out the podcast if you miss if you uh, miss any of the shows at ForteCatholic.com slash radio. We will be back live next week with Mr. Andrew Laubacher. See ya!